and uh, who was uh, a wonderful person. And uh, Professor Taiha was uh, a, a, is a graduate of Queen's University, and now uh, he's full professor at Tulan University of Tulan. And uh, he's very active in the area of commutative algebra and uh, a very busy person in different contexts because uh, he's among the editorial board of uh, some leading journals, uh, including Journal of Algebra and its application. So over to you, Professor Taiha. And uh, he's going to discuss something about the containment problem, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Over <laughs> to you, Taiha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can you uh, can you hear me now? Um, yes, perfect, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so first, I would like to thank the organizers and and Simpa for running this school and uh, for inviting me to give my lectures here. Uh, it's an honor uh, for me. Um, unfortunately, um, I cannot be there in person. I was actually looking very much looking forward to my visit, uh, not just. Not just because it's, it's, it, it was going to be my first time um, visiting Lahore, but also it, it would be a chance for me to visit my uh, collaborator, um, Hassan Mah uh, Mahmoud at uh, Lahore G uh, GC University. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, this past two weeks, I got uh, COVID-19, so I'm actually still uh, in uh, isolation <laughs> and uh, travel becomes impossible for me. <clears throat> So, uh, so uh, with that, I also want to extend my uh, apologies to, uh, to the student, especially um, uh, because I, I understand that it's very different between uh, having lectures online and having uh, lectures in person. So um, if you have uh, any, uh, so I'll try to, to give my lecture the best that I can, but if you have any uh, questions or any uh, difficulties, um, please you know feel free to email me or to raise any question during my lectures um so so let me uh let me share my screen to to see if it's possible okay can uh can yeah, can you yeah. see my screen we can see it okay good so so i'm going to Put down my uh, my email address here. Uh, okay. So if you uh, again, if you have any difficulties, any questions, uh, uh, even if you cannot um, have, uh, you, you do not have a chance to raise it during. Uh, the lectures, uh, please feel free to email me. I, I, I will also, I, I would also like to uh, say a few words about my, the title of my lecture. So when the organizer asked me for my lectures, I was a little bit too ambitious and I, I wanted to talk to, uh, 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 I, I, wa I wanted to talk uh, about both the uh, combinatorial and the geometric applications uh, of containments of ideals. Uh, and then recently, I when I start preparing the lecture, I realized that uh, that it's a bit uh, too much. So I'm going to focus on the geometric uh, part of it. So the title for my uh, lecture is going to be polynomial interpolations and containment of ideals. <clears throat> so uh, so let me start uh, with. Uh, with uh, polynomial interpolations. So um, this is a, a very um, familiar um, objects to uh, to uh, subjects to many of us. So let me uh, begin by uh, uh, recall uh, recalling a few very simple facts. So let's uh, throughout my uh, lectures, I'm going to fix a positive integer.
in picture D. And uh, then it's very easy to see that a polynomial, a polynomial f of x with uh, uh, complex uh, coefficients. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is uh, are actually true for uh, any algebraically closed field, but uh, for simplicity, uh, for my lectures, I'm going to stick with the complex numbers. A, a, a polynomial with complex coefficients of degree D uh, is uh, completely uh, determined by its uh, zeros, right? So that takes, uh, say, uh, given, given complex numbers, A1 up to AD as root is uh, uniquely determined, uh, of course, up to um, a scalar multiplications. So if one uh, wants to have an absolute uniqueness, uh, then we can just impose another condition. So we have a uh, D plus one conditions. So this is a very simple fact. And if, uh, uh, and, and when we teach our, our student uh, calculus two, we often uh, go move on to the next um, fact, which is uh, the Lagrange interpolations. And this is basically saying that given um, uh, this thing's complex number, A1 up to uh, say AD plus one. So now we, we will look at uh, the absolute uniqueness conditions so with the mix D plus one uh, conditions. Uh, A polynomial, f of x, again with uh, uh, complex uh, uh, coefficients of degree d still, that takes given value y1 up to yd plus one at um, given number uh, respectively uh, is uniquely determined. So uh, uh, this is a very, of course, very familiar uh, interpolations uh, for uh, with, uh, for us, um, maybe uh, a slightly less familiar interpolation problems uh, for uh, some of us is the uh, Hermit interpolation. So the idea about Hermit interpolation is uh, instead of uh, imposing conditions on specific values of the functions at specific uh, complex numbers, we can also imposing condition on uh, pass, uh, on, on higher order derivative of the functions uh, at specific uh, uh, complex number as well. So uh, let me give you the generalized uh, Hermit interpolations. So here we are given a number S that is less than or equal to D. Uh, and we have S distinct complex numbers, A1 up to AS. Uh, so these are in C and uh, non-negative or positive. So positive integers and one up to ms corresponding to this uh, a1 of two as um, then a polynomial 
f of x, again with complex coefficients, uh, still of degree d. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and there's a condition of this number uh, such that the sum of this number is d plus one. So this d plus one is the same as this d plus one conditions that we need here in the Lagrange uh, interpolations. Uh, a polynomial f of x inside c of x of degree d is uniquely determined by um, uh, or maybe, uh, yeah, but you're uh, determined by um, the specific values. And let me denote by yij, and that is the chase derivative of f at ai for i running from one to s and uh, any j running from zero to mi minus one. So we impose, again, still uh, d plus one conditions on the polynomial. Uh, and if, if you're interested in how to get these polynomials, then you can look at uh, what is called a, the Neville's algorithm. So what I'm interested in is a slightly um, less general situation of Hermit's interpolation problems. So a polynomial f of x with complex coefficients of degree d here is completely or is uniquely determined by the conditions that if I take uh, all these high order derivative of f at given values ai, you get zero for all i running from one to s and j running from zero to mi minus one. So what this is saying is that given this collection of conditions, of vanishing conditions of high order uh, derivative of a functions uh, at given values, there's exactly one polynomial of degree d uh, uh, that would satisfy these conditions. So the natural questions that one would ask is what happened in higher uh, dimensions? So what happens? in higher dimension. Meaning when we have polynomials of degree uh, of uh, more than one variables. Uh, in, in that situation, would we expect any similar or analogous uh, statements? And so let me rephrase uh, uh, these questions slightly in a more familiar setting. So I'm going to work with the projective uh, space. So here we're going to fix a set of S point in my projective space of N dimension. And of course, this is going to be a projective space over the complex numbers. Um, so usually when I write without the sub-index, it means I'm looking at, uh, at, at this projective space over the complex numbers. If I'm looking at over a different field, I'm going to specify the field. Uh, so let this be a set 
of S distinct point. Uh, so the question is, uh, of course, in 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 the higher dimension, we do we should not expect the answer to be uh, uh, such that there's a unique polynomial satisfy this condition. Rather, uh, the question should be the right question should be how many such polynomials are there? Uh, and of course, uh, when we talk about projective uh, space, we should focus on homogeneous polynomials. So the question here is going to be. Uh, oh, and and let me also give the multiplicity, and let m one m s be positive integers. So the question is to find the number of homogeneous polynomial uh, of degree of a given degree. This is still degree D. And here you can see that I don't have the, the con constraint that the sum of this has to be N plus one, uh, has to be N uh, D plus one, right? So I'm looking at a, a slightly more general problem. Um, of degree D uh, in, so I'm going to fix some notation here. So the polynomial is going to be C x zero up to x n. So this is the coordinate ring of my projective space uh, that vanish that vanish at p i of order um, at least i uh, at least m i. So that's the problem. So in other words, um, in other words, if I let uh, V is the vector, uh, be the vector space, of those homogeneous polynomial, then uh, what is the dimension of this vector space? So that's the, that's the question that we are interested in. Okay, so, uh, so now I'm going to uh, make use of a, a very famous theorem uh, uh, that is the uh, Zariski Nagara's theorem to understand uh, these questions in a language of, uh, in an algebraic language of uh, symbolic powers, uh, Hilbert functions, okay, and Hilbert functions. So my next section is one point two is going to be uh, Zariski. Nagara theorem and Hilbert functions. And in fact, I'm going to uh, uh, focus on Hilbert function of point. So um, so let's 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 focus on uh, let's focus on uh, uh, Zariski and the Gara theorem first, and then I'm going to in general, and then I'm going to uh, talk about what it means uh, when we look at ideal of points. So uh, again, uh, 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 let, let me just say that we are fixing um, the ring being the coordinate ring of our 
and dimensional projective space. Um, so definitions, this is 1.2, if I get my number right. Um, so let I be an ideal in R. And let M be um, any uh, natural number. Then we're going to define the M symbolic power. of I, maybe I will highlight this uh, terminology. The M symbolic power of I uh, is defined to be, so the notation is M to the brackets M and it's going to, it's going to be the big intersections running from all prime P being an associated prime of I. And what we do is we, we are taking I to the M in the localization of P, of R at P, and then we strict down to R. Okay. So, so let me also uh, make a remark here in case you see something uh, slightly different, is that in, in the literature, there are two different definition of symbolic powers that are equally uh, uh, study. Um, one is you have the associated prime here, right? And the other one uh, is when you replace associated prime by minimal primes. Okay, so the two different uh, definitions for us later on, we're gonna focus on radical ideals. And for radical ideals, these two notions agree. So there's no confusion. But generally when you talk about symbolic powers, one has to specify what notation or what definition you're going to use. Okay. Um, so theorem. So maybe I'll put number one point three here, and this is uh, Zariski Nagata, and the theorem says that for a radical ideal. And this is why I don't particular, particularly mention both definition of symbolic powers because uh, uh, for the one, for the, for the ideals that I'm using, they are going to be the same. Um, for a radical ideal I and uh, an integer M or natural number M, um, we have a different description for the symbolic powers. So the M symbolic power of I is gonna be the same as all polynomial inside R, such that if you differentiate and uh, let me specify that these are vectors, uh, it's a partial derivative of F um, where with no more than M minus one times, you fall back into the ideal. Okay, so for example, um, and maybe I'll take a note here, that um, if my A is a zero up to a N, then by this, I really mean is you take uh, you you take the f um, to the sum of a i of f, and then you differentiate with respect to x zero a zero times x n a n times. So that's the uh, that's the notation for. Uh, for the uh, delta uh, or partial uh, or eighth partial derivative of f, okay? 
so uh, so this is the Zariski and Nagara theorems. Um, now, if I specify two points, so Zariski and Nagara theorem apply to points. Now it's, uh, um, so let's say that we have again S points and uh, the ith point is given by uh, the coordinates A I zero up to A I N. So these are homogeneous coordinates. And uh, it's not very hard to figure out what the defining ideal of this guy should be. So the defining ideal, let me denote by P of I, uh, it's gonna be, maybe I write it down here. P of I is gonna be um, the ideal generated by A I J X zero minus A I zero X J, where J run from one to N. Right, so this is the homogeneous ideal of a point. And if uh, instead of one point, you get a bunch of points, right? So if X is P1 up to PS, uh, then it corresponds to uh, the defining ideal IX, which is just P1 intersect, intersect PS. So uh, the defining ideal of the union is the intersection of defining ideals. Uh, we can also think about uh, each point as, uh, as a, a multiple point. So it has multiplicity. So if I write Y, so I think about Y as the collections of uh, points still with support P1 up to PS, but I think about uh, the point P1 being a point with multiplicity M1. And uh, the point PS with multiplicity MS. Or alternatively, so alternatively, I can just think about Y as M1 P1 plus MS PS. So this is just, uh, formal notations, it doesn't really, really um, means much. Uh, then the corresponding ideal is gonna be, so here you want, uh, you want uh, uh, a multiple, uh, uh, P1 with multiplicity M1, so the defining ideal is gonna be P1 to the M1. And of course the union of these points is going to correspond to the intersection of this ideal. Right. So uh, this these ideals uh, or, or uh, this this um, kind of collections of uh, multiple points are often referred to as a fat point scheme. Right. So maybe I put a so why is called a fat point scheme. or collection of fat point for simplicity. Okay. Um, so, uh, so if we apply um, Zariski's uh, Nagara's theorems to this particular situations, we get the following uh, statements. So, the statement says that if I look at the defining ideal of this fat point scheme, and if I look at the degree D piece, right? So, the collection of all degree D homogeneous polynomial inside this ideal. 
uh, or equivalently, if I look at P1 to the M1 intersect PS to the MS, and then I'm looking at the degree D kiss, uh, this consists of exactly the homogeneous polynomial of degree D in R, of course, in R, that vanished at PI of order at least uh, MI for OI running from one to S. Okay, so, um, so I, I look at the schedule of the of, uh, of the school and I notice that there's a discussion section afterward, right? So, um, so I'm going to give you some exercises for those that are who are interested, so that you can try during uh, the discussion. Uh, so the first exercise is to derive corollary 1.4 from the Zariski and the Gara theorem. So theorem 1.3. <coughs> All right, so, so the question now that we are interested in, so questions, and let me give it a, uh, maybe this is exercise, uh, let me give you a, a number so that I have the right number to refer to. So this is exercise 1.5 and it's question 1.6. So the question now is uh, given, of course, our degree D, our multiplicity, uh, find the dimensions of the degree D piece of the defining ideal of Y, okay? Now, when you look at, when you see such an expressions, uh, the first thing that comes to mind should be Hilbert function. It should remind you of uh, Hilbert function. So let me uh, talk about Hilbert functions. So Hilbert functions. Hilbert function of point. Okay, so um, let me define Hilbert functions uh, for graded algebra in general. Uh, if I start with a graded ring, so a graded ring is usually written as R, the direct sum of RD where D is at least zero. So a gridded, and here again, we are going to um, focus on uh, algebra over C. Uh, the Hewitt functions of R is given by H uh, uh, and is a uh, function from uh, z zero to uh, z. And this is the function that send a degree d to the dimensions of its degree d piece. Okay. Um, and for a so the point, or generally, for a subscheme of a projective space, right, so let Z be a subscheme. And if you're not familiar with the word scheme, just forget about it because for us mostly 
we're talking about set of points or uh, the worst is we talk about set of fat point. And in fact, we are not going to be even talk about set of fat point in general. We're going to focus on set of point with the same multiplicity uh, at the end. Okay, so um, the Hilbert functions, Hilbert functions of Z is defined to be, maybe I should put a color coding here, uh, is, is defined to be, so I'm looking, I'm writing H of Z instead, and I'm just defining it to be H of the quotient rings, All right? So basically it's the, uh, again, it's the function that send the non-negative integer to the integer uh, by sending D to just the dimensions. Maybe I should write here. Uh, to the dimension over C of R over IZ and look at degree D piece of this guy. Okay, so let me uh, let me give you an example, right? So uh, let's look at an example to see how uh, these functions uh, behave. Maybe I'll look at a, a more a slightly more general situation, and then I'll run through a very specific example uh, right after this. So, so again, we're going to consider a situation where we have S distinct points inside uh, projective uh, space PN. Uh, and of course, we're going to assume that uh, each PI have coordinates being uh, AI zero up to AI end. Uh, so, if we are to look at the Hilbert functions of this subscheme, right, or this set of points, then what we're going to do is we're going to analyze. We, we want to figure out if this is actual. We want to figure out what is this dimension or how does it look like. That means we want to figure out how is uh, the degree D, degree D piece of this guy looks like. Okay, or we want to figure out if you're given a homogeneous polynom polynomial of degree, and we know that it's not in I x what does it look like or what determine whether or not a homogeneous polynomial degree d should be in i x should be in defining ideal of x right so a general so we start usually we just start with a general homogeneous polynomial and then we look at the condition for it to be inside the ideal right so a general homogeneous polynomial of degree d is of the form so I'm going to write f and I'm going to update the, the variable uh, so it's going to have a coefficient so I'm going to label the coefficients by the degree so d zero zero and that's x zero to the d right so it's of degree d right so it could be x zero to the d or it could be d minus one one zero zero x to the zero to the d minus one x one, right? Or all the way to c of zero, zero and d, and then x n to the d, right? So that's a that's a homo that's that's a general homogeneous polynomial of de uh, degree uh, d, and of course, uh, what determine these polynomials are the coefficients, okay? So these are the unknowns uh, 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 for us. Uh, now, so, so, and, and it's, it's not very hard to see that you have exactly, uh, let me even write that here. So you have uh, n plus d choose n coefficients. That we are yet to know. So if we impose the conditions that But F has to be inside the ideal of X, meaning F has to vanish 
at P1 up to PS. So the condition that F of PI is zero gives us one condition, so give us one equation. And basically we just substitute the, the variable x uh, x zero up to xn by a zero up to a n, right? So the so the equation would be c of d zero zero, and you have a zero instead of x zero, and of course all the way to c zero zero d, and you have a n instead of x n, and this is zero. Okay. So if you look at the vanishing conditions at all points in X, so the conditions F is inside the defining ideal of X, basically correspond to a collection of equation. Right? So is equivalent to a system uh, well, for each point, you have one equation. So for S point, you have S equations. And in N plus D, choose the unknowns. And those unknowns are the coefficient C, okay? So particularly that implies that if you look at the degree D piece of this guy, it corresponds to uh, the solution space, right? So this is the solutions space to a S by N plus D choose N matrix. Okay. And so if you look at here, you, I'm looking at a complement of that. Right, so the Hubert functions, so that basically say that the Hubert functions of X at degree D is the rank of that matrix, right? So of a, an S by N plus D choose N matrix. So if you know uh, the size of a matrix, you know how much the rank can be at least Right, so as a consequence, very easy consequence from here is that whatever X is, your Hilbert function cannot be, can never be too, too big, right? So it's never be more than the means of these two numbers. Okay. So particularly, if somehow you know that at some degree d, your Hilbert function is s, right? That's the max that you can you can grow. And if you know that the Hilbert function is growing, then once it reaches s, for example, it has to stay s, right? So let me give you another example with a more specific number of points. So let's say that I'm looking at six point, right? So this is uh, maybe I'll draw it here. Six points, okay. and I'm looking for the Hilbert function of, of X, okay? So I'm going to analyze uh, how many homogeneous polynomial of some degree that can fall inside the defining ideal of X right there. So here I'm going to start with the ring R and then the defining ideal of X. And then of course, eventually I have the Hilbert functions. And I'm uh, maybe I'll move down a little bit. And then I have the degree, right? So degree. So degree will start at zero, right? And then you have, so homogeneous polynomial degree zero, and then you have homogeneous polynomial degree one, two, three, four, et cetera. So in a polynomial ring in n plus one variable, here, uh, let's say in inside P2. Let's look at points inside P2. So you have three variables. So for the polynomials, you have one dimension in degree zero, that's just the complex numbers. Uh, three variables, so in degree one, you have dimension three, 
uh, in degree two, we have dimension six, and then 10, and then 15, etc. Now, if I look at the defining ideal of axioma, of course, there's, uh, there's nothing in degree zero. Uh, if you look at linear equations, you, you want to look at lines that passes through all six points. That's just impossible. It's quite easy to see. So again, there's nothing here. Uh, let's say if you want to look at conics that passes through six point. Now, conics is degree two. So if I look at a line, right? So if I look at a line going through these three points, that's going to intersect a conic at three points. And you know that a line and a conic should intersect at, at most two points, right? Otherwise, they have to be, they have to share components. That's the Bazou theorem. And so um, the only possibility is that that conic contain this line as a, as a component. But then that means it has a line, it, it is two lines. So you have this line and then another line. But there's no way you can find another line that passes through these three points, right? So there's no, uh, there's no uh, conics. In other words, there's no degree two. So here you, are, uh, you already have zero, okay? And let's look at the Hubert function here. Now, the Hubert function is the difference between the rings and the ideal. So here I have one, I get three, uh, and then I get six. So as you can see, S is six, right? So S is six in this case. And once I get to six, I know that I cannot, cannot go any further. Right? It cannot go any higher. And I know the Hilbert function of point will not reduce. So without doing any uh, uh, other calculations, I know that this is going to be six. Six. So, 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 um, oops, sorry. So uh, these values already tell me that what is coming next has to be all six. So that's one easy uh, way of, uh, using these inequalities to determine the Hewitt functions of uh, point, okay? And so let me uh, give you the definitions here. Uh, or maybe I'll give you an exercise before doing that. So as a generalization of this, I can also uh, look at uh, fat points, right? So let Y be M1 P1 plus MS PS, and this is going to be inside n dimensional projective space, so that I have the same kind of inequality. The Hilbert function of Y is always at most the mean of, um, maybe I should write it out here, the mean of. Uh, again, one number is going to be, uh, so this is for the S. So this is going to be sum of I running from one to S. And I have N plus MI minus one choose N. So that's replacing this S up here. And the second number is still N plus D choose, uh, choose N. That's something that uh, that's the Hilbert function of the ring. So you cannot go beyond that, okay? And so the definition for us, is that a fed point, a fed point scheme, Y being M1, P1 plus up to MS, PS uh, is set to have the maximal Hubert functions, or sometimes we just say has the generic Hubert functions. Okay, if we have the equalities, or maybe at degree D is to be specific. If the Hilbert functions at degree D is exactly the same as the mean of S, uh, oops, of uh, the sum
Um, for those of you who are familiar with multiplicity, this is just the multiplicity of, of the ideal, okay? So the question that we are interested in, of course, is to compute the Hilbert function. So it will be really nice to know if the Hilbert function actually, uh, or uh, if, if the, your, your scheme actually has maximal Hilbert function, right? So the question, that we are interested in is which fat point scheme y have maximal keyword functions. Okay. So, um, for now, we're going to focus on a very, or oh, I mean, this, probably the, mo the, 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 the most basic case of this question, that's when uh, uh, our multiplicity are the same. So we need to focus on the equi uh, multiplicity situation. So the focus is on the equi multiplicity. case and that is the same that is the, uh, the same as saying that all this um, multiplicity are the same and I'm going to denote that by M okay so that's that's our focus and uh, what we expect what we expect, is that, well, things should be nice if your points are chosen randomly, right? So we expect that when the point in X are chosen randomly, then uh, our end And now y, of course, with the same multiplicity, you can write as m times x, um, then y should have maximal Gilbert functions. So that's, that's the general philosophy. Uh, unfortunately, this turned out to be quite a difficult problems. And in, in fact, even just in the, the simplest case, when m equal to two, that's already uh, a, a major work. And so let me talk about the next sections when I talk about, uh, when I move to the Alexander, Alexander Herschelvik theorems. So the Alexander Herschelvik theorem basically confirms these expectations when M is two, right? Um, so this is maybe I'll write out a theorem. So this is 1.14. This is the, or the uh, Alexander Herschelvik theorem. And it basically say that if we have a set of S general point. Now, um, I'm not going to explain exactly what general means yet. I'm going to actually come back to this, but first now just think about this as being points that are chosen that are picked randomly, okay? Uh, and let's, y be just two x, right? So you get multiplicity two. Then y has maximal Hilbert functions at 
at degree D with the following exceptions. So it turned out that the expectations is correct, except there's a list of exception, exceptional cases. So first is when D equal to two and uh, S is any number between two and N. So that's an, actually an easy case because you're in P2. So a lot of arguments one can use, uh, in a lot of arguments one can use the Zeus theorems to uh, work, uh, to, to get to exactly what the Hilbert function in this case <coughs> should be. <coughs> Excuse me. When d equal to three uh, and n equal to four and s equal to seven. So if you have seven points in uh, P4, then for the cubics, uh, that's going to, that, uh, uh, the cubics, passing through seven points in P4 will not have the expected dimensions. Uh, D equal to four, uh, N is between two and four, and S is N plus two, choose N minus, uh, choose two, minus one. So for example, if N is two, you get five point, if n is three, you get nine points. And if n is four, you get 14 points, okay? So um, I think I have, uh, um, maybe it's like three more minutes, right? So, um, so, so now, now let me, let me uh, focus on a, uh, slightly uh, different questions. So, so instead of, as, as you can see, computing the Hilbert function is difficult. Even in the case that we expect the Hilbert function to be nice, uh, it's still very difficult to, uh, to, to prove that. Uh, and, and, and here, of course, we only look at double point. Uh, in fact, for, um, for higher multiplicity, there's also a very famous conjecture that basically predicts that there's a list of exceptional cases that if you fall outside this list of exceptional cases, then what we expect to be true would be true. That's called the uh, SHGH conjecture. Uh, so, so now I'm going to focus on a slightly different questions that instead of looking at the maximum Hilbert function, I'm just asking a very simple question. When is the Hilbert functions uh, uh, different from of, 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 uh, of y, different from the Hilbert function of the polynomial rings, right? Uh, or when does the ideal contain some polynomials inside? So that's a that's a, a slightly different question. So now I'm going to focus on the questions. Uh, when is the Hilbert functions uh, not the same as the Hilbert function of the ring? In other words, when is uh, I, Y, D not equal to zero? Right. So that's my uh, questions. Uh, I, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop here uh, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that uh, you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ha, for a very extensive lecture. So the house is open for the question. Uh, if someone has some questions, uh, first of all, let's check the chat. Something there. Okay, there is no question in the chat. Uh, okay, uh, is there any question in the audience uh, regarding to uh, the first lecture?
Uh, Professor Ha, uh, would it be uh, it would be more appropriate if you can uh, mention some standard reference for our. Um, so 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 actually recently um, I wrote a, a a survey on the Alexander uh, Hershovic theorem. So if uh, if one is interested in this, one can take a look at that survey. So I wrote a survey with um, uh, with Paolo Montero. So um, so it's. Uh, And uh, the title is called Alexander Hershovic Theorems and Related Problem. So uh, in, in this surveys, we talk about the Alexander uh, Hershovic Theorems. We also, uh, this, I mean, we, we basically present the, the proofs you know, from an algebraic perspective and we also talk about how this uh, uh, problem is related to the problem of secant variety, which is uh, something very different uh, if you're interested in it. And, and, wearing, and the problem of wearing numbers. So those are um, uh, uh, very strongly, very, very tightly connected to uh, the, the question uh, or the two, to the Alexander Hondropic theorem. Thank you. And uh, how this problem related to the standard uh, containment problem? Yeah, so that's what I'm, I'm going to discuss next in my, uh, so, so my plan is I'm going to focus on this problem here. And when we start, uh, I'm going to state a number of conjectures uh, relating this problem. And I'm going to uh, talk about the containments and how one use containment of ideals to uh, answer those, question, uh, those conjectures uh, for, generous, uh, for, for general point. Uh, just out of curiosity, I was just uh, curious about whether uh, as the recent result of Nina Gupta uh, relate with this particular problem in some way. Uh, what was her results? Can you remind uh, me? It, it is similar kind of things she was studying. Uh, I don't really remember the exact problem, but it, it, she was uh, discussing about the similar kind of thing, uh, what you stated here in the question. Uh, um, I, I have to check. I, I'm right now. I'm I'm not aware of, of uh, her work yeah, yet. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Is there any other problem? Uh, is there any question or comment from the IBA? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you unmute IBA? IBA wale to slow bolna chahiye. So from the IBA side, would you like to speak something? No question from our side. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Well. If, uh, if this is the case, let's thank the speaker once again. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, a little special thanks to you, Taiha. And, uh, uh, we can uh, discuss later if uh, whatever the time is more suitable for you, we can move your talk uh, to a bit later in order to accommodate you as much as uh, No, actually, 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 my uh, my next three talks are actually in good times for me. I mean, this one is the only one that is a little bit too early. I'm, I'm a night person, so like giving talk at like 11 or 12 o'clock at night is fine for me. Uh, so after this one, the, the rest of the talks are fine. Actually, yeah. good. Thank me. you. Thank you. Please take very good care of yourself. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. That's all for Thank today. You Thank well. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now. Uh,